very entertaining speaker with us this evening. She is, she is, she is so enthusiastic about everything that she presents that you yeah. will be mesmerized, I guarantee you. Um, this is Greta, okay, not Soros. Soros, got her, got her. Greta is an art teacher at Arcola. Uh, elementary, which is Northwest Allen County Schools. She brought a buddy of hers who's also a teacher at, at Arcola and Northwest Allen County Schools. And the reason I say I, Chuck is Chuck Kaduk, he's, uh, I, I was his supervisor when he was student teaching. And that's, that's what he got to <laughs> No, but he came along to, to be entertained and also to help out as he can. Which is, she always needs lots of help. So she graduated from St. Francis University. She is a um, Miami tribal member, and she's youth education coordinator for the Miami Center. So let's welcome Brenda. Thank you. Aya, Wakanswa Nehi Greta Wainswayani, Nila Miyamiya, Kekiange E Minutiani, Tepewe Nila Koke. So I means hello. And then I told you that I am called uh, Greta or Wakanswa, that's my name. So I know they gave me a Master Naturalist badge, but also I went ahead and put on my um, camp badge because when we're teaching our cultural camps for the youth in the summertime, um, they're going to know my tribal name, my name, and then the Miamia word or the Miami word for teacher, which is Kwanguya. Um, can my friends in the back, like Randy and Allie back, can you guys all hear me okay? Because I'm not used to talking to a room so big. Okay. So, um, I said that also I was Miami, although in our language we pronounce that Miamia, and that I'm also from Fort Wayne, which is Kikaiongay to us. And I don't know, I have to put this in here, because every little fourth grader in the area learns that that means the place of blueberries. And we have no idea where that comes from. <laughs> and Kikayange means the old man's place. We're not sure why it's called that, but that's the name that the we use place? to this day. The old man's place. Yep. So, um, I did want to start by saying that every time you meet, um, I, I represent the Miami tribe. I am a Native American. And our tribe is friends with other tribes, and we often do intertribal activities. So anytime you meet someone who's a member of a tribe, you, you will interface with their specific tribal identity, but also even if, like, say, a Potawatomi friend or a Jibwe friend was with me, there are practices, I would customs that I would practice or lessons I would know because we were friends and I was respecting their culture too, right? And then there's some that sort of well, that kind of encompasses Mary Taylor cultures. But then within being Miami, each Miami person kind of have, knows, because we're individuals just like anybody else, we're going to be experts or more knowledgeable about certain things. So um, Danny Tipman, who's one of our elders, she used to do this presentation. Danny's really great with history. I kind of stink at history. <laughs> so if you want to know Miami history, I have some really great books, and I can point you in the right direction. <laughs> And also, that it's not just the, uh, like the by blood lineage members of the tribe that are knowledgeable culture bearers, but close friends to the tribe, in some cases employees that have worked with us for decades, um, or the people that get married in and have children with Miami people, also part of our Miami families, and they are also culture bearers. So in my own family, it's my mother, who's Miamiya, and my dad is married in, but you're gonna see him at more events and he knows more of the culture than she does because he chooses to participate more. So it's not, you know, don't make the assumption that the person you're talking to, you know, knows everything or knows what the next person knows. I mean, um, my mom's a wonderful person, but she, when she was little, it wasn't really a good thing to be Miami where she grew up. So she's kind of kept herself a little separate from it has only come back around now that her children are more involved. Um, I have two brothers, they're hardly involved at all. My sister and I both work for the tribe and both our daughters work for the tribe. So families run like that. In every family, in every tribe, you're gonna find members regardless of uh, lineage. Like some people are really involved and some aren't. So back to me and my specialty, 
Tonight, what I can share with you is um, one of the things that we teach during our cultural camps, which is Mito Senawingi Ashishionganji, which means we the people live on the land. So that's what I'll be sharing with you tonight. I did bring like a lot more stuff because people always have questions, and I'm happy to like answer questions that go beyond that or help point you towards the correct resources. So to begin, um, we the people live on the land is really powerful. So I'm going to go back even to um, our coming out story. And that is, our coming out story says that we the people came out of the water. Now, um, they referenced that point as being somewhere up the rivers at South Bend, thinking that we came in off of Lake Michigan, headed down towards uh, the Fort Wayne area. But then there's a metaphorical we the people coming out of the water too. And when I first took Master Naturalist class, gosh, it's been almost 10 years ago, hard to think, um, we got to the part where we learned about, you guys cover where this was ocean, right? I was like, oh my gosh, the land came out of the water too. That's so exciting, you know, like we're connected even down um, at that deep of level. And I referenced that because that ocean was part of the geological history that shaped Indiana, okay? And the way that people speak is based on the way that they live, and the way that they live is based on the land that they live on. So when we live on the land, it's really a relationship we have with the land. Um, and so I remember, like, learning the Miami language can be so hard, and you're going to learn it all your life. You're going to learn new stuff along the way. And in my lifetime, I don't know that I'll ever master it. But there was one year I was going to give up on it, and one of our elders was like, you know, if you really want to understand how we, the Miami people and the Miami culture, you really ought to try to embrace the language because it is the way it is, because we had to live and communicate with each other on how to work out that living on the land that we had. And so it it really is the story through and through, all the way, you know, from your heart all the way down to your feet. So living on the land, shaping the way we live. So I thought that was interesting too because I feel like these days we have you know, all kinds of people live in Indiana, and we live here all different ways. And I don't know that people, you know, these days have forgotten that the land taught us how to be people. And so the language that we speak now, the way that we speak, did it come from the land still? You know, it, have we lost our connection to it? Um, that's something I contemplate a lot. If it seems a lot like the way we speak about it and treat it in general isn't a relationship anymore. Like we've lost our partnership with it. And it would be really cool to start changing our dialogue, to start thinking of it in a way where you could, where we could speak in a way to become partners again with the land. Because we still need it. We're not going to get very far if we're not taking care of it and living on it. Um, so for that concept, um, Robin Wall Kemmerer's book, Braiding Sweetgrass, is pretty popular these days. And she's pretty good at getting you started on kind of understanding some of those concepts. I only got a little ways myself. Um, she is, I think, Potawatomi. Anybody check into that more? And I think she's a second language learner. So just know that the customs and concepts in this book come from a second language learner like myself. I wasn't born speaking the Miami language. It wasn't born into an established Miami culture. And so the perspective of a person coming from that, um, from a second language learner point of view, is different than someone who grew up like in uh, Miami or grew up in their community's um, reservation or grew up in a, you know, more immersed in um, a community that still had their language and cultural practices intact. The perspective is still different, but somewhere in the middle, it's taking care of the land that we live on so we continue to be good partners to it. Um, so let's see. And with that, I will be taking you through the Miami calendar, um, lunar calendar year, because uh, our months are named exactly for the ecological changes that happened throughout the year. 
But before I do, because we're still talking about living on the land, I wanted to talk about, there is a video on YouTube somewhere, and it's about what happens when you introduce the wolves back into Yellowstone Park. So some, maybe some of you have seen that video. And so I watched it one day just to see, oh, this will be interesting because I remember my dad complaining about that back when it first happened. And so the wolves were missing out of the, you know, ecology, out of the whole ecosystem of Yellowstone Park. When they were put back in, it started a chain of events that brought more biodiversity back to the park, but it literally changed the course of the rivers as well. So if you've never seen that, it's not very long, it's worth watching, and it's amazing how one thing missing from that picture made such a difference when it was put back in. There's something that's even bigger that's missing from our ecosystem that used to be there, and that's human needs. We, the people, live on the land. We have to actually we live with the land. And we are actually missing from nature, and we've been missing from nature for a couple of hundred years now. But indigenous people live not in opposition or on top of nature, but alongside of nature. And that's going to be the whole basis of everything I explained to you tonight. And we did things like controlled burns. I believe that the parks practice controlled burns, you know, to help keep um, the prairie uh, healthy. So we used to do that. And um, some of the people speculate that some of the bigger, more um, out of control forest fires that we're experiencing these days is because there's not people living on the land anymore burning every year. Like we used to keep that cleaned up, you know. And so what would happen if we could put a partnership of people back into the land? If putting wolves back can change the course of rivers, what would happen if we could put people back? I'm not saying you have to go out and live in a wikiami at a teepee, but to live in partnership with the land instead of us. You know, you guys are all here at Master Naturalists, so I know you got an interest in that, but if we could help share that concept with people, if we could live with the land more. So, with that, we're going to start with the Miamia New Year. So, um, the Miamia calendar is a lunar calendar. Because we lived in partnership with the land, we would have observed things like the constellations and the stars and the path of the sun and the path of the moon, and we would have counted our days by that. So we have a lunar calendar. The tribe issues us a lunar calendar every year. So our first day of the year is different than the Gregorian first day of the year, and it's different every year. In 2012, uh, New Year's Day was January 26th. And in 2013, we had what was called a lost moon, which I'll explain in a minute. So the first of the year wasn't until February 13th. And a lost moon is a calendar adjustment. The way that we have leap year in a Gregorian calendar, a lost moon is a 13th moon added into our calendar every year to adjust the um, lunar calendar back to, uh, to reset it. So the first month of the year is called Makunsa Kilswa. Kilswa is our word for both sun and moon. And Makunsa is um, the word for bear cub. So that early, that, that um, well, the first part of our year, but late winter for everybody else, this is when the bear cubs are born. And the bears are going to start to feel like they're coming out of hibernation soon. And so that was named um, for that ecological change. And then it also is sugar bush time. So, um, uh, you know, you've been through winter, maybe you're working through your food stores, and food's getting kind of low, but now the earth is waking back up again, and the animals are waking back up again soon, and the sap is flowing in the trees, and you can harvest sugar, so it's time to start things over new and fresh, like there's new provisions. So um, we have a cultural resource um, center here for the tribal members. We just got a really lovely property um, kind of on the northwest part of town. And so it has trees out there, maple <coughs> trees. And we, for the first time as a community, have been tapping trees. Not everybody is, we pretty much just launched um, programs 
and we just hired employees, so it's in the beginning stages, but they've been out there tapping the trees, not just the maple trees, but walnut trees too. I didn't know you could tap um, walnut and get it sap. Mm -hmm. So interesting enough, the uh, walnut makes, it takes less walnut sap to make syrup than it does the maple, but I think the maple tastes better and that's why people go for it, so. <laughs> yeah. So that is, um, that is the beginning of our year. It's still winter, and it's still winter because the spring peepers, the little frogs, haven't started seeing. So, as, so once they do, winter's over and then it's summer. Um, we have two major seasons, winter and summer, and in Miyamiya tradition, we allow a tiny little sliver for transition between the two at either end. And we have names for those, but they're not considered, like, like we would consider spring and fall their own equal seasons. They're not really, it's either winter or it's not winter. We can either tell stories, which we can only do in the winter time, or we can play lacrosse, which we can only do in the summertime. And the spring peepers define that. So when the frogs start to sing, then we have to quit, we have to put the stories away, and then we can get out our lacrosse sticks. And that usually coincides with the thunder also, because we'll hear thunder in the springtime. My daughter would be like, does this mean I can get my stick? <laughs> but she, she wants to play, right? And um, thunder uh, is called chinguia, has all kinds of representation in our culture. It's got the, some of the diamond pattern symbols that you'll see in our culture are actually represent thunder and there's the weather element of thunder but then there's also the story element of thunder being its own being and some people even have talked about the little spring peepers as being like the wives of chingui of the thunder because they kind of come in together and leave together so but there were spring peepers active today no oh well who was telling me they heard them, but not in full force? So he's like, just wait, they gotta be in full force. Because yeah. the weather has been goofy, and we've had some thunder, and that makes it straight. So coming up on the tail, the Kunsa Kilswa is on Dekwa Kilswa, which is the crow moon. So you, you get that in that late February, March time, and the crows are, I don't know if anybody's had nesting crows in their neighborhood before, but it is noisy. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, obviously you would have heard that, and that's how that moon um, got its name. And then the moon that comes after that, we're looking at like later March, a lot of April, would be the Sandhill Crane mm -hmm. moon, named for the migration for the Sandhill Crane, the Chichap of Kilswa. And the Sandhill Crane is, I don't have any crane representation, that is our, one of our main, um, I guess you could call it a totem animal. Because some people call us the people of the crane, and that's based on a story where it was believed that these cranes saved one of our villages from an advancing war party because the war party startled them and they flew off and making these loud noises in like the foggy, misty morning was too terrifying, too spooky, and they decided that wasn't a good sign and they backed off. So it is a very important animal to the tribe, and they're just beautiful. Have you guys ever made a trip west? There's that. There's a Jackson Pulaski County that has the big reserve for the cranes. Yeah. That's worth a drive. Yeah. They're huge and they're beautiful and they got great noises. They have cool dances too. Yeah. So that brings me to the first month I can really dive deep into um, the ecological ties, and that's the Kuya Kill Swap. And that's like that late, later in April, cruising into May. And Wakulia is our name for whippoorwill, which was a little ground bird we used to have around here a whole lot. And um, the problem is domestic cats came in and they pretty much eradicated all the ground birds that we have. At least that's what they teach in our tribal camps. But that um, the whippoorwill would start to call um, at this time, at that time, that late April, early May, and they're calling because they're going to mate and build their nests and have their eggs. And they're only going to do that if the ground temperature is warm enough to have eggs on. So if, the, if, the, if it's good enough for the birds, it's good enough for us and it's time to plant the crops. 
And so that was a really important uh, mood for us, is when we hear the birds calling, now we know it's time to get busy and um, plant stuff. I did bring um, some of the meow meow corn that we're famous for. We were famous for um, a white flower corn. And I brought some of the seeds for that that you can check out later. And um, it depends on what family you're in in the Miami tribe. But the, most of the Fort Wayne people have a specific way of planting the corn. You have to sing to it and dance to it or it won't grow to you, for you. And so I was taught to, uh, there's, to put the corn in your mouth. And you're going to sing to it with it in your mouth. And the last time I got to plant corn with a group of ladies, one of the ladies would go ahead and she would use her foot to make the little trough that you would drop the seeds in and dance her way down the row. And the woman behind her would have the corn in her mouth and be singing to it and planting it and using her feet to cover it up. It would just sing your way through the garden. Now that's not a practice that's widespread throughout the whole tribe, but it's more specific to uh, the women that live in this area, is what I've been told. I've always lived in this area, so I don't know about you know, other people's practices. Well, after that is our midsummer moon, which is usually around late May and June. And uh, these days we have our cultural camps at that time too, because kids are off in the summertime. So a lot of us that work for the tribe will travel west to Oklahoma. That's where our tribal reserve lands are. And we'll host a um, camp for kids out there, for youth, to teach them language and culture. And then we come back around here in July to Matea Park to host the camp for our kids um, in the summer. And that is, doesn't really have to do with ecology. That's all school. But that is what we're busy doing that time of the year these days. So let's see. So the um, late June and July is our Kishinguia Kill Swag. And so Kishinguia is our word for the green corn, the green corn moon. So um, a lot of tribes, when the corn is green, you can still eat it. It's kind of got like that uh, lighter, milkier texture, and it's tender still, and you can eat it like fresh. Whereas if you wait till later in the season to harvest it, it's going to feel, it's going to be harder like a seed or flower corn would be. And so uh, a lot of tribes have like a green corn um, sort of holiday. I'm going to call it a festival, but a celebration. We don't really have any record of us doing that. None of the elders remember that tradition being passed down. So that does separate us from other like local tribes who may still have those traditions. So I think that's interesting. Um, and that's, this is a perfect time to point out that even if Native American people share similar values and practices, we're still distinctly different people. Like the Miami people lived here, but we were right up against the Potawatomi and the Shawnee, and those are three distinct people with different customs, um, similarities, but different enough to be different people, and also different languages. And even though we share similar words like makwa for bear, if you go to a Potawatomi um, gathering, they're going to be using the same word for bear, but the whole rest of the language is like completely different. I can't understand any of it all. And um, I kind of think that's fascinating. There are hundreds of tribes in the United States, and it's like that everywhere you go. Uh, we were at a language, um, the Stabilizing Indigenous Language Symposium several years ago, and we met some people from New Zealand there, and they couldn't believe it. They're like, we heard that every tribe in the United States has their own distinct language. And we're like, yeah, it's pretty true. And they're like, New Zealand's just all the same, no matter what tribe you're a part of. And maybe have different dialects, but we can all understand each other. And granted, it's much smaller than the mass of the United States, but just in this tri-state area, there's three distinct languages. You know, um, I kind of wish, I mean, that has my curiosity. I'd like to kind of know why. Um, oh, you know, I forgot to talk about some of this stuff on the table, but we can come back to that. So after our green <coughs> corn, it gets to be late July and August, and we call that the Meshuiah Kill Swallow, which is the elk moon. So something else that's missing from Indiana is the elk. 
used to be here, that that would be like the mating season for the elk, and so the males would be out uh, um, calling, and you would hear that everywhere, and so that was that's why we call it the elk moon. Okay, and then we come up to um, the late August and September area where it's the grass burning moon. So we talked about the controlled burns, and we call that um, the shashak yoli akil swa. So the grass burning moon when we would do controlled burns to sort of reset um, nature. And October is kioli akil swa, which is smoky burning moon. I feel like that that's sort of a transition over and we're talking about like harvest times we usually have like a really nice fall festival out of our grounds and we do um, a traditional dance called stomp dance that originated with the shani that they gifted to us um, so also i think it's important to mention here when i'm thinking of the shani giving us stuff that in the Fort Wayne area, it wasn't just Miami people living. Like this was a major like trade intersection for you know all the the Three Rivers meeting and people coming from the north and the south. So in Kikiangi, there was the Miami village, but then you had a Shawnee part and you had the Adawa part and you had like the the Potawatomi part. All these people were living together and while they were distinct people. They were also sharing things back and forth, and that's how we ended up with stomp dance, which we like to do there in the fall. And that brings us to the young buck moon. Coming up after that, you know, um, and then the last end of the year we call it the buck moon. So, and then the nuzzled in between buck moon and makutsa kilswa, the beginning again, is makwa kilswa, it's the bear moon, the bears are go to sleep. So bear, like, I personally love bears, they look like people to me, so I would never want to hurt one, but it was a Miamia delicacy to eat bear. <laughs> and um, Miamia people would hunt bear without, um, without weapons. So you would need a group of people, and somebody had to be the brave one to get the bear to come out of its den. But once out, it will always turn to charge the person who touched it. So if you circle the bear and you touch the bear, it turns to you, but somebody else touches the bear and it turns towards them. And the idea was to keep the bear turning at a different person until you wore it out. And then they would literally just walk the bear to the village where it would be slaughtered and butchered for like a feast or something. But yeah, bear was hunted without heavy weaponry. So, so glad that wasn't me. <laughs> <laughs> So on my table, I have lots of things that come from the land. Uh, here's one of our spring activities. These are elm bark baskets. And so um, if you've ever seen like birch bark baskets being made that are really beautiful and you can, um, those are more the northern tribes because we just don't have enough birch in our region for it. This is our version of that.